So uh, the first speaker is David Kirkby from UC Irvine. And uh, he's going to talk about cosmology and, um, sorry, statistics and large scale structure. And uh, he's done analysis in this area with the BOSS experiment and also in science planning for DESI. So uh, David, go ahead and take it away. OK, thank you. Um, so I apologize for the rather lengthy title, but I wanted to be uh, precise about what you'd be you hearing about. Um, so how to use statistics to describe the large scale structure of the universe. If I left off the how to at the front, you would be expecting me to tell you about the statistics and show you results. Uh, and that's not what I'm going to do. This really is going to be a, a how to, kind of a practical um, tutorial. And, and what I hope is that um, after, after uh, the next hour, a lot of the, uh, the vocabulary that you're, you're used to hearing people use, um, will, you'll, you'll have a, uh, I think kind of a good intuitive framework for how those, those different statistical techniques uh, fit together. Notice that LSST is not in the title. So this is really kind of a general um, uh, tutorial on, on using statistics for large scale structure. Um, but I will try and uh, include some LSST specific examples. So uh, the organizers asked me to um, give a talk that was essentially the same as one that I gave um, at a, a set of tutorials for um, people interested in LSST coming from particle physics. Coincidentally, it was exactly nine years ago today that that, uh, that, that happened. <coughs> and you can see that um, that was also an hour tutorial. And my, the title I had there was Statistics in Cosmology, so pretty grandiose. Um, and, and, uh, but I, I actually covered more there than I'm going to talk about today. Um, but in fact, um, that was uh, uh, an hour with a lot more than I knew about statistics in cosmology when I, uh, when I was asked to give this talk. So pretty much everything that I, I presented there, I learned in the week before. So it was very fresh. Um, so I'm afraid you won't get the benefit of kind of the fresh perspective. Um, <coughs> but it turns out that a lot of the stuff, just by chance, a lot of the stuff that I chose to, uh, to talk about um, in that tutorial is stuff that I, I've, be, I've been using um, really uh, on a daily basis um, ever since. So I think you know, it's, it's a good, it's a good uh, set of, of topics. Um, and also I've found that there's a lot of, um, kind of formulas and plots that I keep looking up and coming back to. So I've tried to include those in the, in the lecture notes. So I hope you'll find that useful. And you might notice that uh, you might find some mistakes. If so, please tell me. I'd like to know if I've been using the wrong formulas for the last 10 years. <coughs> OK, so we're going to be talking about the statistics of the large scale structure. It, there's going to be uh, more uh, math and statistics than, than, than physics here. Um, but I just want to start out by setting the context for large scale structure. So we say large scale structure, but what do we actually mean by large? How large is large? Well, it, it really depends who you ask. So, but for me, um, to be large, it has to be at least one megaparsec. <coughs> OK, so a megaparsec is, uh, is about 3 million light years. So that means that we're looking at things um, at least 3 million years in the past. Um, and Hubble's, uh, you know, Hubble's law tells us that a galaxy that's only one megaparsec away is moving away from us just with the, the, uh, the cosmological expansion at 70, about 70 kilometers per second. So that's what that, when we say h is 0.7, that, that just translates directly to the 70 kilometers per second. So in this, um, in this uh, lecture, I'm going to always be using co-moving distances, so distances as we measure them today um, in, in the expanding universe. Um, but I'll mix to get the uh, megaparsec and uh, megaparsec over h units. Um, and you just, I, I, you know, I put them in. You need to pay attention um, when it matters. And the thing that I always forget is which is bigger, a megaparsec or a megaparsec over h? Um, and kind of counterintuitively, it's the megaparsec that's bigger. You think that because you're dividing by something, um, well, I guess it's less than one. So anyway, I always, I always have to, to think about that. OK, so um, another way of thinking about uh, a megaparsec scale is our local galactic group is about a, uh, a megaparsec across. It's about 0.8 megaparsecs between the, uh, the Milky Way and, and uh, Andromeda. So that means that um, for the purposes of this talk, we're going to take all of the interesting structure inside of our local group, blur it out more than that, and we're just going to distill it down to one number, to one average density for that whole group. Okay, so, that, so we really are talking large, large scales here. Um, and you know, the experts in the audience are probably muttering, well, with one megaparsec, that's still not really very large. And, and, um, and what they're thinking is that um, although we can measure the structure on one megaparsec scale, it's actually not that useful. Um, and that is because it, to interpret our measurements, we want to compare with theory. And it's much, much easier to compare with theory um, on, on really large scales. 
Um, and the large scales are good because that's where the simplest theory, the linear perturbation theory for how in inhomogeneities grow, um, works. And so, um, so I, what I've plotted here is, a, is as a function of redshift. So uh, here we are today, redshift zero, going out to redshift five. And just for reference, the, the average redshift for LSST is going to be about 1.2. So right here, where we have a broad distribution of galaxies kind of going out like that. <coughs> so, um, so what I plotted here is uh, for different scales and different redshifts, how linear things are. So basically how easy it is to interpret the data. So the green zone, that's good up here. Here we're getting into kind of an intermediate muddy zone where you can use linear theory, and it'll be OK, but it's not going to be great. <coughs> and down here, where you definitely can't use linear theory. And what this notation here means, sigma over mu, so that's basically telling you about the, the width of the, um, the distribution relative to its mean. So if here's, here's mu, so in normalized coordinates, so sigma of mu looks sort of like that. So here's 0. Um, so, the, so the green zone is, is, uh, is that or smaller. Sigma of mu of, of 1 is looking more like that. Um, and you can see there's already a problem here, because the thing that we're, that we're pl plotting the, the distribution of here is, a, is a something like a density. So it can't be negative. So as soon, you know, the fact that you've got 15% um, down here means that it's, cl it's clearly unphysical. So, that, so that's why when you get down here, you've definitely got a, definitely got a problem. <coughs> Mu is just the mean that th th this could be a dense. Well, you'll see because we're going to do an exercise where you're actually going to measure mu. So I won't. Let me just leave it for that. <coughs> okay, and then lastly, so large scale structure. Well, where's the structure? So here I've shown you two um, uh, a density field. These are slices through a, a simulated universe. <coughs> One of these has, you know, is, is, the, uh, is the, the jackpot. It has all of the information, noise free. You can measure BAO from this. Um, <coughs> You can measure matter radiation equality. You can measure neutrino masses. And one of them basically has no scale information in it at all. Okay, which is which? It's pretty hard to tell. Okay, so the structure, when we talk about structure, it's pretty subtle. And that's why we have to use statistics to, to, uh, to do this. I'm not going to tell you which is which. <coughs> okay, and of course, the most important question in large-scale structure is, should you use the hyphen or not between large scale? <coughs> And as you can see, the experts uh, don't agree. So we have Hawking doesn't, doesn't use it, but uh, Peebles does. So I'm not going to be able to resolve that for you today. OK, so um, large-scale structure in LSST. So LSST is going to map the locations of about 20 billion galaxies over 20 years. And as I showed you in those, in those examples of structure, we have to use statistics to, uh, to get anything out of that. But it's really a gold mine. We're going to be able to um, map the, the structure of coherent shape, dis shape distortions. Um, we're going to look for the imprint of baryon acoustic oscillations, um, look for the effects of the neutrino mass on clustering. And what I, would keep remember, what I would want you to keep in mind is that in all of these different types of analysis, the fundamental object, the thing we really want to measure in large-scale structure analysis is the matter density field. So it's just a, a density field, so in, in kilograms per meter cubed. And, and we're lumping together the dark and, uh, and baryonic matter. Um, and, and on the, the linear scales, um, that, that, we're, uh, that we'd like to measure, these basically have the same proportion, about 5 to 1. Um, so that they're not really separate, separate uh, fields. Okay, that's fundamentally what we want to measure. If you knew this um, to high accuracy, you, you, can, you can do all of this. <coughs> okay, so this is an example of a matter density field. I actually just included this because I just figured out last week how to make a nice plot like this in Python. So if you're interested, uh, come and ask me afterwards. So, so the, the, the simulated data I'm going to show you all is derived from this, uh, this data set right here. And there, you can see the scale there is about 10 megaparsecs over H. <coughs> OK, so, um, so you should have a handout um, in front of you, all of you. So I want you to, to, to pick that up um, <coughs> and look at the axes on this handout. <coughs> OK, so there's axes around all four sides. Left and right are uh, co-moving distances. The top axis is angular separation, and the right axis is redshift. <coughs> so uh, <coughs> right, you're going to be working together. <coughs> <coughs> so that, well, there's two versions. One has blue galaxies, and one has red galaxies. So first thing, how should you orient this as the observer? Look at the axes. How should you orient this? 
Yeah, redshift is, is going up the page vertically, so you need to tilt it away from you to orient it properly. Okay, so, so we have at the bottom 1.17, 1.23. So the, the median, the average redshift at the middle of this slice of the universe is 1.2. That's the average redshift for, uh, for the LSSD galaxy sample. Okay, so next question. How far away should you hold this so that it is in scale? Okay, th th this is a chunk of the universe, a little slab of the universe. If I'm the observer, how far away should I hold it so to put it in scale? <coughs> what? Yeah, okay. Uh, not quite. You're on the right track, though. <coughs> so your, th your thumb is about one degree wide. Okay, so if you look at the top scale, so that's two degrees wide. So you need to hold it far enough away that, um, that the, whole, the width of the page was two, two thumbs or two fingers. Okay, so it's basically, at, you need to hold it at four arms lengths. Okay, so it needs to be at four arms lengths or like that, so that's in scale. So just so you have a picture of what, what this is. Yeah, no, no, our arms aren't that long. But, um, <coughs> okay, so just so you have a picture of how, how, this, how this fits in kind of to an observing framework. <coughs> Okay, so now with your partner, I want you to uh, just sketch quickly um, what, what you think the relative, the, the scales of these various things are that I've listed. So the full moon, um, one LSST chip, a 2% photometric redshift error, and uh, if, you're, if you get that far, then also what is the, the spectroscopic resolution of BOSS for 1,000 kilometers per second or the BAO standard ruler? Okay, don't worry if you don't know what that means. <coughs> so, just, so just sketch that on, along the relevant axis. You have to decide what is the relevant axis. <coughs> yes. It's okay. Yes, they're yours. <coughs> Does any pair of people not have a sheet? No, okay. I think they turned this off, so... Oh, okay. So, how big is how big is the uh, the full moon? Sorry. How big is the full moon? If you were to put the full moon on this oh, image, how big would it be? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you would. So right now you're just <coughs> so, so full moon. You always have to let them do it. Oh. <laughs> so how about an L? Sorry. <laughs> how about an LSST chip? <coughs> So if you're not sure what, what the question was, uh, just put up your hand because we have, we have people um, here to help. So. Uh, I think that's okay. But if you wanted to have like, a small conversation. I can just do that, right? Well, that's locked on. I could change it oh. until you could do that if you'd like. Uh, sure, that maybe that's good. I just need to see it for a second. Oh, this doesn't matter too much. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Okay, so now you wanted to turn it off. Okay, so, um, so let's come back. And um, so I'm going to show you... I'm going to show you um, the answers for this. <coughs> okay, so here's... I, I marked up on here the, the various uh, scales to help you set the context. And remember, this is four, four arms length away. So first of all, the full moon is about a half a degree, 30 minutes. <coughs> the LSSD chip is about half of that, so 4,000, um, 4K pixels with 0.2 arc seconds per, per pixel. Okay, so you'd need uh, about eight, eight chips to cover this um, sideways. <coughs> um, 
So a 1% uh, photo Z error, so when we say 1%, what we mean is DZ over 1 plus Z. So we multiply by 2.2 at this redshift. So that's about a 1% photometric error. Okay, so in LSST, we're going to measure this axis with exquisite precision. Okay, 4,000 pixels covering that little bit there. But that's a 1% error. 1% is pretty good, so we're hoping to get 1% to 2%. Um, with, I think it uh, uh, should be only 10% worse than 4 10% of the galaxies will have errors worse than 4%, which would be this whole, bigger than this whole thing here. Okay, so very different uh, uh, precisions for lo localizing things in those two axes. Um, <coughs> since I work on BOSS, I have to just point out that uh, the BOSS with a, a modest resolution spectrograph gets a DZ of uh, about 10 to the minus 3 here. So. <coughs> um, and then BAO is... Uh, we wouldn't want to take one over z of zero, so <coughs> it's, it's just a, a convention. I mean, one plus z is kind of it's like it's like wavelength, so it's a good it's a good proxy. Um, and then this big circle here, so this is this this is the uh, the scale of the BAO standard ruler. If I had done this on a different redshift, it would be exactly the same size in um, in co-moving megaparsecs. It's it's a standard ruler. It has a fixed um, co-moving size. Um, and so it's, it's, it's uh, pretty big here. Um, and I think if, uh, if Shirley makes it, she'll be telling you more about, about BAO. <coughs> okay, so now, um, as a team, what I'd like you to do is to use a, uh, a quarter you should, um, to sample this toy universe. And so I, I set up a spreadsheet here. Um, <coughs> so if you enter, enter this URL, you can enter your, your data. So you guys are now going to be our, our data collecting um, team. So as uh, work out a strategy in, in the pair for efficiently collecting, uh, collecting your data. Um, so if you go to that, that link, I'll sh show you what it looks like. So you each have a team number written on your handout. So find your team number, pick a name, and then enter your samples here. Okay, think about your survey strategy. What? Yes. <coughs> Yeah, only, only one person per team needs to open, open their laptop. <coughs> They're L's. Uh, L6, TNL1. Uh, five minutes. I changed the font. I changed the font on the screen so you can actually read it now.
Well, I think part of the problem is that. Okay, so this is great. Um, you guys are all signed up um, for shifts, um, although I think I'd rather have the, uh, the red team um, than the blue team. Um. <coughs> okay, so, so what we're seeing here is a, uh, is a, a histogram of the, of, uh, of the individual samples for people using the, the red sheet or the, uh, or the blue sheet. So I apologize. This, this is a... Um, just, just getting a, a Google spreadsheet to do this. I know it doesn't look like a histogram, but that's, uh, that's the best I could do. If someone has any, is an expert on, on Google spreadsheet charts. Um. <coughs> so, so, this is a, so this is an early prototype for LSST uh, data management, um, but I've heard it's going to improve. Well, this is not so bad. Um, okay, so what have we actually measured? So you've, you've taken samples. Um, and under each sample, you're counting the number of, uh, of galaxies. So basically, the histogram, the units for that histogram in the horizontal axis are galaxies per quarter. No one used the Canadian quarter, right? Yeah, that, that would be an, a systematic error, <coughs> um, or a euro, even worse. Um, so this is basically just two numbers that we can get from these measurements when we do the histogram. We can get the mean um, number density under a quarter, um, which should be about 8.5. Um, and we can also, and, that, and that's telling us basically the mean density is related to the mean density of, uh, of dark plus baryonic matter. Okay, so that's, so that's, that's telling us about the expansion history of the universe at that epoch, the redshift of 1.2 we're measuring. But we can also, more interesting is, is measure the spread in these numbers. And if we assume it's a, a Gaussian, then that just boils down to one number, the standard deviation, which is about three. And so what that's telling us is about the variability in the clustering of the, uh, of the matter. And you can just clearly see by eye that there is clustering. That there, are, there are voids and there are places where things are, uh, are clustered together. So that, that's a, a way of boiling that down to, uh, to a single number. <coughs> um, so, um, but, but these units of galaxies per quarter, so we, we'd like to, to not use uh, things with dimension. So, um, so we nearly always um, take what we actually measure and turn it into um, what we call a delta field. Um, and so the delta field that we can construct from your experiments is uh, a, a delta field for galaxies where we're measuring the, um, the number of galaxies on a quarter centered at R, and we'll subtract from that the mean and then divide by the mean. So we're going to get something that by construction has a mean of zero, um, and we've taken out the dimensions. And, and these averages, we need to be a little careful about what those mean. So they're on ensemble averages of some type, and I'm going to come back to that. What are we actually averaging over? And then the thing we'd actually, we're actually interested in is not galaxies per quarter, but it's the equivalent delta field for the, um, for the matter density of the, of the universe. So that would be a, a, a rho um, at r divided by the uh, take, taking out the, the mean matter density. <coughs> so, um, so we measured something about this, the, the, the spread of this distribution. So is that related to, uh, to sigma 8? Is that actually what we measured. Um, well, it could be because I actually I scaled that handout so that the radius of a quarter is exactly 8 megaparsecs over H. Um, I'm, I'm going to tell you, yeah. So, um, so and, and one of the consequences of using a delta field is now we can only use the delta field to study um, 
the, the spread because we've taken out the mean, so there's no information here in the, uh, in the mean. So you can think of this like as a density contrast. It's positive, equally positive, and, uh, and negative. So the standard deviation now is about, is about point, uh, 0.35. Um, <coughs> so is that sigma 8? Um, so what is sigma 8? <laughs> so sigma 8 is, uh, is defined as the standard deviation of fluctuations in the total matter contained within a random hard sphere with radius 8 megaparsecs over h. Okay, so you just, you just pick a random point in the universe, you look in a sphere of 8 megaparsecs over h radius around it, you add up all the mass, how many kilograms are in that sphere, and that would be one sample. So I exactly analogous to what you did in, in two dimensions with your 8 megaparsec over h quarter. Okay, and then you make that histogram for spheres in the universe, and it's the RMS of that histogram um, is sigma 8. Once you've normalized, but you have to do that for the delta field. You don't do that for the, the histogram of kilograms. You do that for the histogram of the, of the delta field. So that's the definition of sigma 8. <coughs> we usually calculate sigma 8 using linear theory, and that's how we compare, compare theory to the experiment. Um, I, I, I believe the origin of it, where did the 8 come from? It's, it was originally chosen so that the answer would be about 1. Um, although, of course, that's not very linear. So. <coughs> Yeah, that, that's a good question, yeah. And obviously, you, you, there's a limit to how many independent uh, quarters you can place down on your paper, so I'll come back to that, yeah. So the galaxies that you use, so they're, they're basically, they're tracers of the underlying matter density. So you can think of, um, at any one region of space, there's some average, um, th there's some density associated with that, and you can think of that as the mean of a Poisson process. And that's, a, uh, that's exactly how I generated those, uh, those galaxies. But they're bias tracers. <coughs> and what, what we mean when we say they're biased is that we're making the assumption, a very simple model, that the, the delta field we calculate with the coins is just equal to the delta, delta field of the mass, but just multiplied by some constant. So that constant is the bias. The bias depends entirely on what your tracer is and how you measured it. So it depends on the fact that they're galaxies, um, how they were selected, it depends on the fact that we're using quarters, not euros. Um, <coughs> and, and note that another, we're sweeping a lot of stuff under the rug here, and one of those things is that on the left we have a, a, we're using number densities, and here we've got physical densities in, in kilograms per meter cubed. Okay, we're we're just so we're effectively assuming that all galaxies represent the same amount of uh, of dark and baryonic matter. Okay, so this linear relationship is the simplest possible model, but it's it's uh, it's very widely used. Um, it's definitely wrong in detail, but it's actually not too bad on uh, on large scales. So what is the bias? So it it depends on all the details of your analysis. But typically, you end up with numbers between 1 and, uh, and 4, depending on how they're selected. Uh, although the Lyman alpha forest, which, which I work with a lot, um, actually has a bias that's much less than 1, about 15%. And it's actually negative. So if you're interested about that, you can ask me later. Well, I'll tell you later, yeah. <coughs> um, so, so one more wrinkle is that these, uh, these delta fields, um, and therefore both the bias that bias is not really a constant, and sigma a is not really a constant. They both evolve with redshift. So really, when you're measuring something, you need to, you need to specify what the redshift is. So what we actually measured here is the bias of, of, our, of our analysis um, at redshift 1.2 times sigma 8 at 1.2. So we did measure sigma 8, but multiplied by this unknown bias. And you'll often see that in, uh, in large-scale structure analyses, that there's this bias normalization. So you end up actually measuring something multiplied by an unknown bias. <coughs> that is the definition of bias. It's, the, it's a, a constant of proportionality between what you want to know, the delta field for the underlying matter density field, and the delta field, however you defined it in your analysis. So in, in that case, you Well, in, in, in a simulation, yeah. So, so he's, he's saying, well, where, how, how do I even know this? Because, because we don't actually measure directly the, the dark matter. So it, yeah, it's basically calibrated with, with simulation types. OK, so we're measuring sigma 8 and bias. Um, so no, another thing to keep aware, be aware of is that when we, when we do statistics of large-scale structure, um, there's always some smoothing to large scales. Okay, the things we measure, a galaxy is really small compared to a megaparsec, and that, but those are the tracers that we use. So there's always some implicit smoothing, um, and it's, you know, I, I find it confusing reading the literature. It's not, it's not often clear 
how the smoothing was implemented. Often it's in multiple stages. Um, so in our exercise, to be clear, what we did is we smoothed over the area of a quarter. So we had basically a hard, uh, a hard disk um, cut off. <coughs> okay, so I gave you, uh, you, you each, there are two versions that hand out, a red version and a blue version. So are they drawn from the same underlying matter density distribution? <coughs> so there's the red one, it has 241 galaxies. There's the blue one, 349. <coughs> Did they count, are they from the same universe? It's a big universe. If you remember, th this is four arms lengths away. There's a lot of these in the universe. So, um, so th the answer is yes, I did. Those are drawn from the exactly the same universe. And this is something you always got to be careful with when you have a finite survey. <coughs> so you can imagine on very large scales, there might be some fluctuations in the, in the, the matter density, so around the average. <coughs> and so one of those was taken up here and another one down here. Okay, so that, that can happen, and that's always a problem, is that um, you tend to normalize things to your, to your survey, but you've got to be aware that you might be sampling a, a not representative. Even if you have a big survey, there can be even bigger um, variations in the structure, in the large-scale structure. Is that, is that a statistical fluctuation, or is that overall large-scale structure? <coughs> it's overall large-scale structure, yeah. Uh, how large do you have to get before you get it? <coughs> Um, <coughs> well, that, that's a good, uh, so that brings us to the next topic. In fact, you can never really get large enough. So. <coughs> okay, so, um, so I said we need to be a little careful about how we define our ensemble averages. So really what we would like to do, <coughs> you, you ended up moving the quarter um, from one location to the next, <coughs> but really what you should do is you should be, put, you put the quarter in one place <coughs> on the red sheet, and then you put it on the same place on the blue sheet. And then you need to do that on a green sheet and a yellow sheet. Right? You need to be looking at the same place in different universes. Okay? Because that's not very practical. So we can't really do our averages by exploring different, the same location in different universes. And so what we end up doing in, in, instead is we end up looking at different places in the, uh, in the same universe. <coughs> So given one universe, what we're doing is we're assuming that the statistics of the underlying matter density field, the thing we care about, are invariant under two operations. Translation, so if you move from one place to another place in the universe, it's not going to be the same. Okay, if I go from Milky Way to Andromeda, it's totally different. But statistically, it's the same. <coughs> and also rotations. So the names associated with that is uh, homogeneity, that's saying that you can, you can translate, and isotropy, that's saying that you can, you can make rotations. <coughs> Okay, so another issue, coming back to your, your question, um, so if this is our whole universe, if, if our smoothing is so, if instead of using a quarter, we use a box this big, um, there's really only four independent measurements that you can make. <coughs> if you use smaller boxes, you get uh, more independent measurements. And so the, the name associated with this fundamental statistical limit on how precisely you can measure things on large scales is, uh, is cosmic variance. <coughs> So if you want to measure things on the largest possible scale, you've only got one measurement. So for, for the experiment we did, where we measured bias times uh, of sigma 8, so the, the fractional error on the standard deviation is, uh, goes like this. So the, with there, there's, you, there's exactly uh, 50 quarters worth of area on those, uh, those graphs I gave you. So that means the cosmic variance limit is a 10% is a error. If we actually look on this uh, sheet here, <coughs> so here are the statistics. <coughs> so um, since I told you we can actually combine those two universes together, it's all the same universe. So naively, we would say that you actually got a 5% error for measuring bias times sigma 8. Okay, but the cosmic variance limit tells us that, that that's not true. There, there really is, there, you, we've saturated the cosmic variance limit just, just in doing our measurements today. Okay, once you've done that, then you might, you know, there's no point in, in going any further. So, this is a, you were thinking about our strategy. So, if I use, I just try to do some random <coughs> and see what I get into cell outside the box. So, if I did it randomly and I only picked samples that didn't overlap with each other, would I get a different answer than if I tiled it exactly across the, across the slide? Well, just by picking ones that don't overlap, that's not random. Right. And so, I think, you know, given that there's only 50 quarters worth, that's probably the best strategy. 
Um, to, you you want to saturate the cosmic variance limit as fast as possible, so the best strategy is probably just to tile your quarters across. Um, well, so LSST is going to basically tile the sky, and we have the, and we build in overlaps, um, and we have the dithering as well, where we'll come back to the same field, but just offset a little bit and rotate a little bit. That, that's mostly for systematics control, not to deal with this issue. <coughs> okay, so so far we've just been looking at variance. Sigma eight and other statistics like it are just measurements of variance, um, and because we assume homogeneity and isotropy, variances do not depend on position. So sigma eight at a given redshift. Sigma is just one number for the whole universe. Okay. But more generally, we're interested in covariances, um, so which are usually represented by this uh, uh, psi. And so covariances are much more interesting. They depend in, in general on two positions. And so the covariance, this is just a number. What is it? It answers a question. Given the delta field at R1, what is your best guess for the delta field at R2? So it lets you make predictions. <coughs> um, and so again, um, how are we going to we, we ideally, we'd like to measure the, the correlation function um, using the, uh, two points at R1 and R2 and then do the same thing in a different universe and so on. But instead, what we do, using homogeneity, we'll say that we can take our two quarters and as long as we move them so that they, they have the same relative to position, that gives us another sample. Okay? So, now, so now we're making a two-quarter measurement instead of one-quarter samples. <coughs> so that let, homogeneity lets us do that. If we assume the universe is also isotropic, you don't even need to keep them in the same re relative orientation. You can spin them around as long as they've got the same distance between them. <coughs> so in this case here, the correlation the function becomes just a function of the vector difference between R1 and R2. And here, it now just becomes a function of the magnitude, just the, 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 the scalar separation between them. <coughs> OK, so, so I've simulated here doing the same experiment you did, but now with two quarters and keeping them a fixed separation apart. Um, and what we see, so, so now I've made a scatter plot of galaxies under, under one quarter and galaxies under the other quarter. Um, and here are the histograms, solid and dash, for the two quarters. And so those both look the same because that was, we were simulating an isotropic homogeneous universe. But when you look at the scatter plot, there's a new piece of information which you could never deduce just by looking at the one-dimensional histograms. Okay, and that's the, the correlation um, between those. So usually, usually um, uh, summarized with a correlation coefficient, so a dimensionless thing between plus and minus one. Unfortunately, we've got a lot of uh, we've got a lot of rows and a lot of deltas floating around in this business. So that's a completely different row. <coughs> yeah. It's it's from the universe I simulated because there's a lot more. Yeah, there's a lot more than fifty yeah. points here. Yeah. <coughs> Pardon me. That, that's what I put in. Yeah. I mean, you don't know the separation, so. Yeah, so this, this would have to be on large scales to have a negative correlation. <coughs> okay, so, um, so the cosmological matter density in our universe, the, the one that we're sampling, is a single realization of some underlying random field. So you've probably heard that, but what does that actually mean? So, so a random field is just an infinite um, set of random number generators, um, uh, I call 5R, and they're infinite because they're indexed by position r, which is continuous in space. So if we just look at two of these, two random number generators, so you can just think of these as a piece of code that spits out a random number every time you call it. Um, and if I call this one, it's going to give me a number at that point. This one, it gives me a number at that point. And I can do that for the infinite number, of infinite set of these random number generators, and I'll get a realization of some underlying delta field. Um, if I change the seed, I'll get a completely different realization. Okay, so our universe is just basically corresponds to one random number seed for each of these infinite number of generators. <coughs> okay, but unfortunately, that infinite set of 1D uh, histograms for the generators does not completely specify the field. Okay, so for example, the covariance is an, is an arbitrary function that you need to specify as well. Um, not totally arbitrary, it has to be positive definite. Um, and that's going to specify the correlated behavior of pairs of, uh, of generators. <coughs> And these generators, you think about it, they have to talk to each other because the only way to arrange that um, points have this, this correlation like that is you need more information than just the, the specification of these one-dimensional histograms. So that's, so that's called a two-point. That talking to each other is, is embodied in the two-point um, uh, probability distribution. So in a, for a general random field, you need to specify 
um, two point, three point, basically an infinite uh, series of, uh, of additional functions like, uh, like chi. And knowing all of the correlations up to um, endpoints doesn't let you tell you anything about correlation um, beyond that. Okay, so it's pretty hopeless. Do you mind just clarifying the design for the distribution set as opposed to the selection? Yeah. So, so the <coughs> oh well. So the value. So the value of this function is not. Although we call it the correlation function, uh, yeah. I said, but there's no. We often confuse this called the correlation function. It doesn't spit out values of uh, of of that correlation coefficient. So. So the positive definiteness is something. Um, well, may, maybe I come. It's, this is a more technical point. It's just. Um, Right. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to show you basically a matrix, a way of representing this as a matrix, and that matrix is positive definite. But the matrix has elements which are negative. Right, that's, so that, that's the, I think that's, that's the way to think about your question. <coughs> okay, so we've already met two major simplifications of the matter density field that make our job a lot easier in doing statistics with large scale structure. Uh, statistical homogeneity and statistical isotropy. So now we have a third major simplification, and that is that we assume that our universe is the realization of some Gaussian random field. So it's a random field, but it's a special kind. It's a Gaussian random field. Um, and so this is a good approximation on large scales, and, and this is due to physics, not math, the in inflation in initial conditions and the, the linear growth of, a, of structure. Um, and so what is a Gaussian random field? So the definition is that all of those endpoint joint probability distribution, so the correlations of three, four, a hundred points, are all multivariate Gaussians. <coughs> and I'll show you exactly what I mean by that in a minute. Um, and so what that means is that they're all fully specified. You only need to know two functions to fully specify all possible correlations. You need to know the mean, which in general is a function, and the covariance, which is general a function of two positions. But for our, if, we, if we bring in our, our first two simplifications, the mean now is just a number and the correlation function is just a, it's a function just of a, of a scalar uh, separation. <coughs> okay, so, um, so the delta field of a physical quantity, it's, it's, a, it's a physical thing. So it's independent of any representation. Um, and so it's useful to, when we're talking about the statistics, um, to, to think of the delta field as actually a vector. Okay, it's, 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 a, you know, it's a special vector because it lives, it's basically got an infinite number of dimensions. Um, but we can kind of sweep that under the rug, and it, I think it simplifies the notation and helps to, to, uh, to focus on, on what's important. So, so one possible representation of a delta field is so as basically as an image, and you can think, so a delta field is like well, some long list of numbers, but you can turn an image like this into a list of numbers if you just go first through the rows and then through the, uh, the columns, basically unravel it into one long list of numbers. So that's what I mean when we say, so that, that's a representation of this, uh, of this delta field. But we could equally well take the Fourier transform of this image, and then unravel the pixels in the, in the Fourier transformed image. So that would be a representation of this vector in, in terms of wave numbers. <coughs> so, so the basis vectors, so the two spaces we're going we're gonna to focus on are, are R space or a real space. Um, so here's, a, here's an eigenfunction in real space. It's just, it's just a delta function, so just, just, one, uh, just one dot in the, in the parameter space. And here's the corresponding um, basis function, so that delta function now in our, in our, uh, our Fourier space. So, th so these are just, um, so it's just a, a wave aligned, uh, aligned with this, uh, this um, the position of the delta function in, in our phase, just a plane wave. So, so these are just two different sets of, uh, of uh, basis vectors that we can use to expand our, our delta field. And, and by thinking of things more in terms of these abstract algebraic objects, um, we can, uh, it simplifies um, understanding kind of the, what's, what's important. So the probability density for observing n samples from a Gaussian random field is just given by this equation here, which is basically up to some normalization factors, just like a chi-squared. It's like e to the minus chi-squared over 2. <coughs> um, and there's one new ingredient here. So there's our delta field. So the new ingredient is this C here. So that's the covariance matrix. And it's a matrix, infinite dimensional, OK? but you can represent it in any basis, just like delta. So if we look at that covariance matrix in R space, um, then this is, this is uh, what it looks like. 
So here I've got um, different separations up to 200 megaparsecs over H. Um, <coughs> and because the, the, uh, um, the covariance only depends on the, 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 dis the separation between two points, it's got this very, uh, there's a lot of degeneracy in it. <coughs> um, and, uh, and what we see is that it only varies along this kind of off, this, uh, this direction right here. So along the diagonal, that's things with separation of zero. And then as you move further and further away, you've got more and more separation. So it only depends on the separation. So this to answer your question. So this is a positive definite matrix, um, but it has negative values here. The, everything blue is, uh, is negative. So, so the elements of, this, of, this, uh, um, of the covariance matrix in this R basis, they are exactly the, the, the values of the, uh, the correlation function. So the, the correlation function is just the, the elements of this matrix in one basis. Um, they're dimensionless, and they can be negative. Um, and we often, although it's, it's really the magnitude of a separation between two vectors, and so it should really be delta r, um, people usually just write r. Again, I'm going to do that for the rest of the talk. So looking at this matrix, <coughs> it's very dense, but it has a lot of redundancy. So there, there must be a better basis, and that's exactly what the, <coughs> the other basis, the k-space basis, provides us. So if I take this matrix and now just make a change of basis, just doing linear algebra, <coughs> it looks like this. So it's basically completely diagonal. These are all zeros, and the only non-zero elements are along the, uh, the diagonal. <coughs> okay, so, so this, in one picture, um, shows you the relationship between <coughs> the correlation function, psi, which is, tells you how things vary in this direction, and the power spectrum. The power spectrum is just giving the values along this diagonal. <coughs> okay, so, so they're, they're just different. They're, they're, they're elements of the same underlying algebraic object in different... Um, in different bases. Uh, it's, it's a constant, yeah, that's true for Gaussian random fields, yes. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so this is the power spectrum. This, this is how I want you to think of the power spectrum. It's just, if we make that change of basis, it just tells us what the value of each element along the diagonal are. Um, so the power spectrum value is uh, are actually dimensionful, unlike the, in, the, uh, in the other representation. They have dimensions of 1 over length cubed. And unlike uh, psi values, they have to always be greater than or equal to 0. Okay, but it's still a positive definite matrix. <coughs> Clear if you have two positions, there's one operation that you can do on them, right? It corresponds to this matrix. But what's the natural? Is there a, a unique step if I wanted to go to three dimensions? What would you, why, how do you do that? Well, so, um, so this this equation, is, as long as you're just sticking with Gaussian random fields, the, all of the say four point correlations are still just described by the the two cor the the uh, a set of two point correlations. So that psi function is the only thing you need to to uh, to get all the four part and endpoint correlations right. Now, however, if you're trying to do something fancier where you want to you want to model something which is not which goes beyond the Gaussian random field, then you have new functions. You have tri spectrum and things like that, and that's up much harder. So, if I want the four point <coughs> so you so your n so n would just be four here, and so this would be a four by four matrix. This would be a, a, a vector of length four. But but the but the elements of that of that 4 by 4. So here I've done a, a, a whatever that is, 20 by 20 matrix. So this, this, is a, this is showing you the 20 point correlation function. But the elements of this matrix, each one along each one of these off diagonals is just given by this function. So that tells you everything you need to know, as long as you're sticking within the Gaussian random field okay. framework. And then my second question is, if, if there was no correlation between 20 and 1, and, and, and in this case we just get a, a diagonal, so we can't get half the diagonal. In the case space, would this be a point? <coughs> No, in the case space, it would look like this. Like yes, okay. yeah, yeah. So you can flip. You you can flip. I mean, th th these are just related by Fourier transforms, so you can just flip them. Well, 
Well, flat but dense, densely filled, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so what? Okay, I think, I think we have to come back to this. I need to, to move on. <coughs> there is some in Western Northern that say anything we measure with the LSFT is not in the depth and that needs to be removed. So the power spectrum needs to be involved in any way. Let's have to find out. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, so what, what does that actually mean that it's diagonal in K space? What that means is that the different K modes um, are statistically uncorrelated. Okay, so it seems like P of K would therefore have to be much better than the uh, psi of R. Um, is that true? Well, y yes, in the simplest cases, but um, the benefits actually get a lot less clear once you start doing a real analysis. Um, so, so this is kind of an area where the theorists you know, tend to prefer the P of K, and, and people actually doing the data analysis actually tend to gravitate more towards using... Uh, uh, psi in my experience. So for example, redshift space distortions, uh, the, the fact that you've got a finite survey boundary, the nonlinear growth of structure, um, all of those. Um, um, and so, so in, uh, in BOSS, we, we tend to, all of our large-scale structure analyses are, are primarily focusing on the correlation function, despite its, um, what seems like the obvious benefits of P of K. So I just want to emphasize that, that the power spectrum and the correlation function are the same mathematical object. They're just expressed in different bases. Okay, there's no more or less information than, one the, than the other. And so what often ends up determining how, what uh, representation you work in is the fact that we don't just want to measure P of K or Psi of R. We actually want to measure its errors. Okay? <coughs> and so that's basically that means boiling, boils down to measuring the covariances of covariances or four-point functions. Okay? And that's actually a lot harder than measuring the, the correlation function of the power spectrum itself. And so really that's what governs how we, how we, uh, we make these choices in practice. <coughs> okay, so the elements of the covariance matrix are just defined as a, of averages over a hypothetical ensemble of realizations, different universes, um, but we use, uh, instead we average over positions and, uh, and orientations. <coughs> so, so this is a coordinate free definition of that, of that covariance matrix. Um, it's just an outer product of the, of the delta fields. Um, and here are the, the definitions um, of, the, of the correlation function and the, the power spectrum in, in terms of those ensemble averages. So it's always just a product of the delta field at two different places, either in R space or in, uh, or in K space. <coughs> okay, so I put those there for reference, but I don't want to go into them in, uh, in detail now. <coughs> so, so in practice, what you really need to know is that to go between them, if I give you a power spectrum, you can calculate the correlation function or vice versa just using Fourier transforms. So th this is, in, in general, in, uh, in n dimensions, the relevant equations, um, and in the, in the Fourier business, there, there's basically there's two degrees of freedom which are totally arbitrary and up to your convention, and those are fixed um, in large-scale structure. The conventions we use, so we have a plus up here, a minus here, and we put two pi to the, the dimension um, on, the, on the K space integral. Okay, but those, if you look at other older literature or place, other places where people use Fourier transforms, they'll look totally different because they made different conventions. Um, um, and since the, the power, for example, only depends, it's not really a vector quantity, it just depends on a scalar, so there's um, a n minus 1 uh, a degrees of freedom here, which are basically just an angular integral that you can do explicitly. And so I've given here for the cases of 1, 2, and 3 dimensions what those angular integrals are. <coughs> um, so now we're just integrating over the remaining unknown, the, the, uh, the magnitude of k, because that feeds directly into the power. Um, and here we have... Uh, we usually write this as a spherical Bessel function, the zeroth order, but it's just the, the sine k, uh, over kr over kr function, or sinc. Um, it's useful to think of it like this, because in practice, you don't just want to do this. Um, you, you end up calculating multiples of everything, and so then this becomes jl instead of j0. So that's why it's, it's good to think of it like that. <coughs> okay, so I've, I've given you on your, your handout now um, a, uh, a set. If you turn to the next page, I've given you um, on the left column, you have three power spectra. On the right column, you have three correlation functions. And, uh, sorry, in the middle. And then on the right-hand column, you have three realizations of a delta field in, in space. Um, and everything is, uh, is normalized. So this is k over k0, k0 times r, k0 times x. And what I want you to do to, to think about this and, and discuss with your, uh, your neighbor, I want you to figure out how things match up. 
So this power spectrum, which one of these three correlation functions does it go with? Which one of these three realizations does it go with? Okay, so this, this is hard, but I want you to, to, to try and develop, to think about this and try and develop some intuition for understanding what are the features um, and how do features map from one to the other. So while you think about this, I just want to, to point out two things you might have not have noticed. So the P of K plots are log log. That's often the way they're, they're shown. Um, and the correlation function plots are linear, but they're R squared weighted. Okay? So, just, um, so the, the, the Y axis is multiplied by R squared. So just oh, no. there you go. <laughs>
Okay, so let's um, so let's talk about um, let's talk about what you're uh, what you're thinking here. So if you notice, you have this nice uh, Art Deco uh, last page here. So what you do is fold it in thirds, okay? And then um, I'm going to ask you to vote on these. So you just show show me the uh, the one that's um, that you think is the right answer. So what do you think goes here? So with that that top left power spectrum, which is the uh, is it A, B, or C that is the corresponding correlation function in the middle column? <coughs> so fo fo fold your... <coughs> oh, that's dead. Okay, for the next one, for B. <laughs> well, I'm assuming that... Uh, <coughs> okay, so, so let's talk about this. So, um, so A goes... With C, so someone wanna, so that's that's right. <coughs> so why why is so what what was your reasoning? Elimination. Elimination. Oh, that okay, that's good. <coughs> okay, that's good. Yeah. <coughs> how did, how did you explain this? So you think those tiny little those tiny little wheels up there give you this? <coughs> okay, you're right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so this this is my day, day job measuring this uh, this bump here. So this is this is the baryon acoustic oscillation um, feature, um, and you can see why we so much like the correlation function more than the power spectrum, right? That's that's the same signal, but it's spread out over many k vectors, many oscillations in the, the power spectrum and very subtle. You can also see why we like R-squared weighting, because um, all of these correlation functions were basically shoot up um, near R of zero, but the R-squared weighting, weighting kills that, so it's a convenient way to look at it. Okay, so if you look at these, uh, these other two, um, so they're exactly, they're actually the same power spectrum, just, uh, just centered. So th this is just a Gaussian, um, so it's par parabolic in, in log log, um, a Gaussian power spectrum. Um, with a different, this one here is centered at k0, and this one is uh, at a higher k. And so you said that the, uh, the one at a higher k goes with uh, power spectrum uh, A, is that right? <coughs> hmm? Oh yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah, the correlation, so, so how did, so, okay, so that's right, yeah. So it peaks, so basically everything is shifting, when you, when you increase k, you're going to decrease uh, decrease r like that. <coughs> okay, so then the maps, so which one, so which one do you think goes with the, uh, the, the top map there? <laughs> Why? It doesn't have to be a permutation. Okay, well, I'm seeing a kind of equal amount of A, B, and C here. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Um, so, so the question is, um, so we've got A goes with C, and which one of these does it go with? So it's, it's actually B. Okay, so I, th I think, and, and how about, um, so the one, the one that peaks at a lower wave number, w which, does it go with A or C? Yeah, so a lower wave number means larger, large-scale structure. Okay, so, so, so one of the things I want you to, to notice here is um, that you, you actually, 
need a, a very concentrated power spectrum before you're actually going to see by eye any structure at the scale where the power spectrum peaks. Okay? And so although generically, so that top power spectrum is basically the lambda CDM power spectrum of the universe, and it does peak, okay? um, but it's such a broad peak that you really don't see uh, that the, the structure associated with that peak really doesn't uh, jump out at you. Okay, so, so the, we're running out of time, so we're not going to do this exercise now. But, uh, so I'm going to leave this as a, a homework exercise, <coughs> and you can come and ask me later. So this is the same problem. <coughs> th th these ones are a little bit, uh, a little bit harder. <coughs> so let me just describe what the power, how, I, how I came up with these G models to, uh, to inspire you. <coughs> so the one on the left is just a straight power law. So that means there's absolutely no scale information here. There's no scale you can measure from that. <coughs> The one in the middle, B here, is two power laws, um, but those are the right power laws to describe that the, the give kind of the best fit to um, to our uh, to our universe. So, but it's just two power laws stitched together, and then the bottom one here is the same power law, but with an oscillation, a pretty substantial oscillation, um, superimposed. And strikingly. Um, all three of those realizations, to me, look pretty much indistinguishable. So this is an example where the power spectra are totally different. So are the corresponding correlation functions. But the thing that we actually measure is a wash. There's nothing. So you OK, so, um, so that, that, that top left power spectrum that you looked at was, uh, was the lambda CDM power spectrum. <coughs> so just generally, here it's, uh, it's features. I put this in for reference. I'm not going to go through it um, in, in, uh, in detail now. Um, if, you were, if you were interested, curious about that, uh, the plot where I showed you the, the nonlinear versus linear transitions as a function of redshift of k, that's also illustrated here. So basically, the red line, so this is where you're, you're, uh, you're very nonlinear. The dashed line, so you were in the kind of uh, gray area where uh, sigma over mu is 0.1 to 1. And then um, uh, to the left, you have the... Uh, um, the kind of the safe region for, for, uh, for linear, um, linear theory. And notice how it, it depends on redshift. So when you look at things further away, you, have, uh, you can use larger scales um, to, to, pr to compare with linear predictions. OK, so just to finally wrap up, so I want to come back to sigma 8. Um, so the power spectrum has units of 1 over length cubed in 3D. But, so we just need to multiply by k cubed in order to get something dimensionless. And so, so this way of doing it, k cubed times pk, with that, uh, we stick a 1 over 2 pi squared there. Um, so that's a useful combination, first because it's dimensionless, but also because it measures the contribution to the variance from different scales. So it, you can think of it as d sigma squared, a variance, um, d log k. So per, it's the amount of variance from a logarithmic interval in, um, in k. Um, and so by variance, I mean here, it's basically the, the delta squared in the as, as a function of, uh, of k. <coughs> and so that means, for example, that if you just, um, if you look at the, so this is just a definition of the correlation function as a Fourier transform of the power spectrum. <coughs> if, you, uh, <coughs> if you plug in r of 0 here, so sine, o, sine x over x is 1, so then we just have exactly that inter the integral of that whole thing up there. So that means that the correlation function evaluated at r equals 0 is just mathematically the total variance of the fluctuations in your, in your field. So that's useful. <coughs> um, but sigma 8 doesn't measure the total variance. It measures the variance in these 8 megaparsec over h cubes. Um, and any smoothing scheme you come up with, you can represent as a, as a weight function, or we usually call them window functions. They have to be normalized, and you, you can write them down either in R space or, uh, or K space. So for the window function of a, uh, of a, for measuring sigma 8, so in our space, it's very simple. It's basically it's 1 as long as you're inside the sphere, and then it goes immediately to 0 outside the sphere. Um, if you take the Fourier transform of that and plot it, um, <coughs> overlay it, uh, so, that, so here I'm not comparing. This is not that delta squared. This is the one with dimensions. Um, and the, 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 the corresponding thing that you need to, to weight it by to measure sigma 8 is shown there. Okay, so, si so when we calculate sigma 8, what we're doing is we're just basically looking at the overlap between the power spectrum that we're assuming and this weird-looking window function. So you know, hard spheres, it sounds like pretty simple. But once you go into k-space, it's, it's kind of a mess. 
So it's, hard, it's actually not that straightforward to answer the question, what scale is sigma 8 measuring? But roughly, most of the weight here is between point, uh, point 0.1 and, uh, and 1 um, h over megaparsec. So it's actually, it's, it's kind of probing the power spectrum on a, on a range of, of scales. Okay, so, um, so I put here a glossary of all of the, the various terms that um, I, I talked about here, which you might not have heard before. Um, and uh, here I have some, some uh, recommended um, reading. So when I um, uh, did this in two 2006, there were some articles from, uh, uh, from Hamilton. I think they're actually notes from a summer school. There's a series of two of them, power spectrum estimations one and two, um, that had just come out the year before. And th those, I, th I think, are very, um, very useful. I definitely recommend reading those. It covers a lot of the same material that I talked about. Um, another paper anyone who's interested in, in statistics and cosmology should read is, is uh, Peg Mark et al., this one with a very for, uh, formidable title, Carhun and Loeb eigenvalue problems in cosmology. Um, and that's actually not at all what it's about. I mean, it's what it's about, but <coughs> what it's really about is it's about Fisher matrices. So if you want to, um, if you really want a, a, a clear, plain uh, uh, introduction to Fisher matrices and how they apply to cosmology, this is, this is what you should read. And then finally, um, although I haven't gotten all the way through it yet, the, the, the book by, uh, by Jelko and Andy, uh, Statistics, Data Mine, and Machine Learning in Astronomy, is, is really useful. So um, the, the, the chapter that I read on Gaussian random processes uh, really inspired me, and I'm just finishing a paper using it. I just learned it from their book. So, um. OK, so um, the, the, uh, the handouts and also an IPython notebook that I used to make all the plots will be available from the, the school wiki page. Importantly, from the guest house, we can't access Slack, so I haven't been able to put it there. Um, uh, cor corrections or suggestions for improving the talk are also, also welcome because it, it could benefit people looking at it later on. So. Okay, thank you.